Let's talk about the pH. You may recall from general chemistry that the definition of pH is that of the negative logarithm of the concentration of hydronium or H+. And if you perform any type of measurement of pH in water, you probably remember that you have a range of zero from 0 to 14. And that's the pH regime in which water works the best. Beyond that, water is already reacting with your um, so uh, either solvents or substrates that you're using. So from 0 to 14, that's where it works for water in terms of the pH. But it turns out to be the case that for organic molecules, that level of pH is very restrictive and not very useful. You can see here in this diagram obtained from uh, this published paper in Angivanta, you um, you have only a tiny, tiny window, and not as bad as sulfuric acid, mind you, but then again, it's not a great window of observation for the pH. And so in organic chemistry, water is seldomly the solvent to use, and um, solvents like DMSO or acetyl nitrile those tend to be the better solvents. They give you a much wider range of pHs that you can actually reach and utilize. And uh, it kind of opens up the door for further chemistry, further acid-based chemistry that you can perform. Now, there's certain molecules like benzene that you know has probably one of the widest ranges for pH. Like you could go to very, very low pHs, really high pHs as well. Uh, it spans over a total of 120 different pH units, which is <laughs> ridiculous. Um, and you might think that, well, what this is telling you is that water is a lot more reactive than benzene, which is true, but you might falsely predict that benzene is gonna be a very unreactive molecule, and it's not. You could actually do a lot of good chemistry with it. But in terms of acid-based chemistry, the stability of benzene is actually rather uh, impressive. And so the other thing too is that when you do acid-based chemistry in solvents other than water, you're not kind of comparing apples to oranges because the pH in water is just given by um, the hydronium that you're forming in water, but you're not really forming hydronium in any of these other solvents. You do have conjugate pairs associated with each one of these solvents, but it's not exactly the same. And since you have uh, changed the window at which these pH calculations or measurements can be taken place, you have to adjust for it. And so this paper kind of um, goes through the process of looking at thermodynamic parameters and looking at the idea of acidity from uh, just thermodynamic arguments. And they create a scale called the mu absolute that makes it um, kind of universal to, to jump from one solvent to another and be able to compare them easily. And if you have time, you know, it might not be a bad read for you, but uh, you actually have to pay to access this. So it's not something I'm requiring you to, to see. But the key point is that you do have to use different solvents if you want to access different uh, kinds of acidity or basicity. You might want to use something very, very basic. So you're going to go to really, really high pHs that water will not be able to sustain. Or you may want to use something very acidic, which, you know, water, once again, it's not going to be able to sustain. So you have to switch to other solvents to perform the chemistry without having the solvent react with your actual substrate, right? So that's what this is sort of showing you. And the most typical solvents that we use in organic chemistry to determine pHs and pKa's for that matter of organic molecules are DMSO and acetyl nitrile which have the following structures. They're very typical uh, solvents used in the laboratory. Although DMSO, um, little warning, if you ever use it, be careful with it. In and of itself, DMSO is not toxic, but it's a really good solvent for dissolving organic molecules. And in addition to that, DMSO is very, um, very easily transferred from the skin into your bloodstream. So it goes rather quickly through your skin. And if it does have any organic solvents or organic solids dissolving it, it will bring those as well for the right. And that's kind of what could make it problematic. Um, yeah. Probably you will not encounter that issue, but in case, this is my public announcement.
All right, now let's talk about pKa. So we changed the solvent to access, you know, a wider range of pHs. And ultimately, the reason why is because we're trying to find out what the pKa's of the various organic substances are. And to remind you, pKa's have to do with um, values of the equilibrium constant for the dissociation of an acid. If you look at the equilibrium constant for this reaction that involves the conjugate pairs, you have your hydronium on top, your conjugate base on, the, on top as well, you have the conjugate acid on the bottom and water on the bottom. If you multiply both sides by water, you, know, you have the equilibrium constant being multiplied by water, which concentration is technically constant because you're not really affecting uh, the amount of moles of water in the reaction. In fact, water is most likely the solvent. The multiplication of those two values, the true equilibrium constant and the water concentration is what we call the Ka. And that leads to what you see right here, hydronium times conjugate base over HA. And I know that you might find this a little, tiny bit confusing because in the past we've told you that water doesn't actually make it into the equilibrium expression. It's actually not true. Water definitely appears in the equilibrium expression of most in the equation, but typically water is the solvent, so its concentration is not really going to change from one reaction to another or from time to time. And as a constant, you know, you simply kind of ignore it because it's not really going to affect this overall ratio. Right, but technically speaking, it should be appearing in those equilibrium constants. All right, now, since pH is a negative log of H plus or hydronium, H3O plus, what we can do is take the Ka expression and take the negative log of it. And one thing that's going to happen is that the Ka will become pKa. But we are going to have the negative log of this entire fragment in there. And I'm going to get into the, the actual uh, manipulation of the equation in a second. But the second thing I want to point out beforehand is that when we do this type of experiments, typically we're talking about titration curve. We have an equivalence point right at this inflection on the, you know, the steepest part of the curve. And at half of that volume, you reach what we call the half equivalence point. And wherever this vertical line intersects at the half equivalence point, the horizontal line represents the pKa, right? In other words, the pH at that point is the pKa. You may recall all of this from your general chemistry classes. This is also known as the buffer region. All right, so technically that's kind of what we're looking for in terms of getting these Ka values. So take the negative log of both sides to turn the Ka into pKa. Now you have the negative log of this entire fraction. And here I'm going to make use of a simple rule of logarithms, namely that if you multiply things inside of the logarithm, you can break it up into two separate logarithms where you add the logarithms together. Now keep in mind that we're multiplying this by negative one. So technically it's gonna look like it's a subtraction, but technically you're adding them. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take out the hydronium out of this thing. So we have negative log of A minus over HA, and we have negative log of H3O plus. And the reason for doing this is because negative log of Ka is pKa, and negative log of hydronium is pH. So what you see here is that if you add this fragment to both sides, you end up with your henderson hasselbalch equation, right? So you may remember all of this from your general chemistry studies. All right, now, for water, one thing I want to show you is uh, how we go to the pKa, because this is sometimes surprising to students the first time they start looking at pKa tables. Um, you might think that the pKa of water is 14, because that happens to be the Kw, but that's not at all the case. Um, the Kw, yes, equals 10 to the negative 14, and that equals hydroxide concentration times hydronium concentration, but in the adult ionization of water, you technically have two equivalents of water as reactants. And as I told you earlier, technically speaking, in the true equilibrium constant, you should have those water concentrations on the bottom. And you have them square because you have two of them present. So if we multiply both sides by the square of the water concentration, then we get the Kw, which is hydroxide times hydronium concentrations. 
All right, so let's take a quick look at this thing. Uh, oh, and one more thing. If you only multiply by one um, equivalent of water here in terms of concentration, then you get the Ka. And this is actually what we're looking for. So equilibrium constant times concentration of water to the first power, Ka. Equilibrium concentration times water concentration to the second power is the Kw. So let's look at the Ka really quickly. And Kw divided by water will do the trick. Uh, so we could use K equilibrium times water or Kw divided by water. It's the same expression, right? So let's take a look at that. Um, obviously, we need the concentration of water, so we're going to calculate it really quickly. And assume that we have one liter of water just to simplify the calculation. If you do have one liter of water and we assume the density of water to be one gram per ml, well, in one liter you have a thousand mls. And if the density is one gram per ml, then simply stated, the mls will cancel out, they will give you grams. So you have a thousand grams of water. The molar weight of water is 18.2 grams per mole. So we divide the a thousand grams by 18.2 and we find out that this equals 55.5 moles of water, which are present in one liter of water. Therefore, the concentration of pure water is 55.5 molar. And this is humongous. This is huge. Concentrations of this magnitude are not common in actual solutions. So this is a huge number that you're not really going to change, which is why we treat water as a constant in the equilibrium expressions. But Dividing Kw by the 55.5 gives us a value of 1.8 times 10 to negative 16, which is the Ka. Take the negative log of that value, negative log of 1.8 times 10 to negative 16, and you get the actual pK of water, 15.7. All right, so this is the true pK of water. And I just show you the derivation to that value. Okay, with that information in mind, now we have uh, a basis for kind of comparing things. Now, water is neutral from our point of view, meaning that it's not really acidic, it's not really basic. So that's going to represent our neutral ground, and its pKa, as you saw here, is 15.7. So we're going to compare the pKa of water to other molecules, and the idea is this. The lower the pKa becomes the more acidic the substance is. The higher the pK becomes, the more basic or the less acidic it turns out to be. So we're going to treat all the molecules here on the left side as being potential conjugate acids. So the higher the pK, the less acidic the substance becomes. The lower the pK, the more acidic it becomes. And I would recommend that you guys memorize this table of pKs because it's going to help you tremendously when it comes down to predicting mechanisms and accounting for reactivities. All right, so what we are observing in this table is that ammonium has a pK of 10, which you might think, well, that's kind of high. However, the pK of water is 15.7, so ammonium is actually acidic compared to water. And that's kind of what you see. You expect ammonium to be an acidic cation. Phenol, so this pH stands for C6H5, which gives you your aromatic six-member ring. Phenol has a pKa of 9, so it's even more acidic than ammonium. Carboxylic acids have a pKa of about 4. And sulfonic acids, which are organic derivatives of sulfuric acid, have pKs that are even negative. And whenever you see negative pKs, automatically you ought to think strong acid. So sulfonic acids are strong acids, just like sulfuric acid is a strong acid. All right, now, values that fall above water, so alcohols, alcohols tend to be between 16 and 18. We'll just say 16 right now for the sake of simplicity. Um, alcohols are less acidic than water. Alkynes are less acidic than alcohols. Hydrogen gas is less acidic than alkynes. Amine or ammonia is less acidic than hydrogen. Alkenes are even less acidic at 44, and your alkanes are the least acidic at 50. So I highly recommend that you memorize this table and these numbers. This is going to help you out tremendously. Now, if these are the conjugate acids, what this means is that you can definitely draw 
the conjugate basis. And by the way, from the point of view of water, anything with higher pKa's are things that are not only going to be less acidic than water, but acidic to the point that they don't really dissociate. All right, so they are really not acidic. And things that are up here with lower pKa values than that of water are going to partially dissociate unless the pKa is negative, in which case they fully dissociate and you have a strong acid. All right, so increase acidity as the pKa value goes down. The opposite trend is true also for the conjugate basis of these substances. So we're going to draw the same thing, but we're going to remove an H+. Plus. Um, oh, and by the way, uh, here I'm putting the other types of acids that you might encounter. So this is the protonated ether, protonated ketone, protonated uh, alcohol, and they all happen to be um, strong acids. All the things here are strong acids themselves, and these are the different pKa's. Um, it might be helpful to remember that protonated oxygens on ethers, alcohols, or ketones will produce strong acids, but I don't necessarily need you to memorize all these pKa's here on the right side. The ones here on the left side, you should probably memorize. All right, so let me get to this idea of the conjugate pairs. If you take every single conjugate acid and draw the corresponding conjugate base, so remove an H, decrease the value of the charge by one, you end up with sulfonates, carboxylates, phenoxides. You end up with ammonia, hydroxide, alkoxide, uh, carbon ions, hydride. These are all the conjugate bases. And what was true of acidity is also true of basicity, but in the opposite direction. So whereas the, the, the strongest acid is present at the top of the table and the weakest acid at the very bottom, the strongest base is actually present at the very bottom. So uh, carbon ions of alkanes, so conjugate bases of alkanes, are the most uh, or the strongest type of bases in organic chemistry that we can have. Whereas sulfonates are technically non-basic substances altogether because they derive from very strong acids. All right, so keep an eye out on that because uh, this boundary for water is going to be very important to, to acknowledge. If you end up producing a substance that is a conjugate base below hydroxide, that should be reacting to completion with any conjugate acid that is above water. And the opposite is not necessarily true. So if you have um, an acid below water, in combination with a conjugate base above hydroxide, you should not expect much of any reaction there, right? So the acid needs to be on top, the conjugate base needs to be on the bottom on this list, and then you get yourself a reaction. And I'll show you in the next video a calculation that will basically make this process rather simplistic. Okay, so um, this particular box right here in blue, we're gonna talk a lot more about when we get to the discussion of substitution and elimination reactions. Okay, so in the next video we'll talk about the equilibrium prediction and we'll talk about some other aspects, qualitative aspects of acid-based chemistry.